Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing adrenoreceptors. Okay, right. Uh, so, uh, we're in the process of discussing how it is that the sinoatrial node actually generates spontaneous action potentials, and then how it is that beta-1 adrenoreceptors uh, trigger an increase in the rate at which the sinoatrial node generates spontaneous action potentials. Okay, so the sinoatrial node has this special type of of a cation channel within it, which is this HCN cation channel. And we've discussed that these channels are tetramers made up of four separate subunits, and that each of the subunits has a membrane-spanning topology that looks like this picture here. Okay, right. We've also discussed that there are four uh, different types of HCN subunit. Now, the main ones which are actually present in the heart are HCN1, HCN2, and HCN4. So HCN3 isn't really present within the heart. Okay, so you have all of these uh, HCN uh, channel subunits present within the sinoatrial node. And these will assemble into HCN channels, and we now want to discuss what these HCN channels actually do. Well, basically, they are going to activate when you have hyperpolarized electrical potential differences across the cell membrane. Okay, so let us plot a uh, graph of the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane. And of course, the electrical potential difference is just the electric change in electrical potential that you see if the little man moves from extracellular to intracellular. Now, basically, when the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane of the sinoatrial node cell gets to around negative 80 millivolts, what happens is these channels open. Now, this is the bizarre behavior of these channels. Okay, most ion channels are opened by depolarization. These are opened by hyperpolarization. Okay, and when when they open, what do they conduct? Well, uh, they conduct sodium and potassium ions. Okay, now which of those is going to be more important? Okay, so let's think about this. Let's start with concentration gradients across the cell membrane. So we'll start with sodium concentration. Sodium concentration of the extracellular fluid. In fact, I'm going to move this down here. Okay, I'll draw a new picture. So here is our new picture. Here is our HCN channel drawn bigger, and it's a tetramer, so it's made up of these four separate subunits, like so, and it's sitting in the cell membrane. Okay, so the extracellular concentration of sodium is 145 millimolar. The intracellular concentration of sodium is around 12 millimolar. The extracellular concentration of potassium is around 4 millimolar, and the intracellular concentration of potassium is 150 millimolar. Okay, so we've got about a 12-fold gradient of sodium across the cell membrane, favoring the movement of sodium in. We've got around a 40-fold concentration gradient of potassium across the membrane, favoring the movement of potassium out. But you have to also factor in this electrical potential difference that we've got, which is currently sitting at a whopping nine, sorry, negative 80 millivolts, which means that the intracellular compartment's electrical potential is 80 millivolts lower than the electrical potential of the extracellular compartment. Okay, sodium and potassium ions, are, sorry, sodium ions and potassium ions are both positively charged ions. They want to be where the electrical potential is lower, which in this case is the intracellular compartment. So in the case of sodium ions, the electrical gradient is is in the same direction as the concentration gradient, which means that you are going to have a massive driving force for sodium ions to come into the cell. Whereas in the case of potassium, the uh, electrical gradient um, is favoring the movement in, and the concentration gradient is favoring the movement out. And we know that this electrical gradient of negative 80 millivolts, that is nearly at that negative 85 millivolts that would stop all movement of sodium out of the cell. So the movement of sodium out of the cell, the driving force of sodium out of the cell, is going to be titchy, basically. Oh, sorry, the driving force of potassium out of the cell is going to be titchy. This is potassium we're dealing with here. 
this is sodium. The driving force for sodium into the cell is massive. The driving force for potassium out of the cell is tiny because this is nearly strong enough to completely reduce this to zero. And obviously if it went below negative 85, it would actually reverse it and you get potassium moving in. Okay, so the more important one is the movement of sodium. Okay, so when these HCN channels open, the majority of ions that move through this are going to be sodium ions coming into the cell. So you are moving a net positive charge from the extracellular compartment into the intracellular compartment. Now what's the effect of that on the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane? Well, if you're removing positive charge from the extracellular compartment, then the electrical potential of the extracellular compartment is going to go down. If you're dumping positive charge into the intracellular compartment, and then the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment is going to go up because you're putting positive charge there. So when we ask how much uh, lower is the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment compared to the extracellular compartment, then the answer is it's going to be smaller. The amount by which this one is smaller than this one is going to get smaller. So this number is going to get less negative, and that's called depolarization when that occurs. So basically these HCN channels are now going to depolarize the cell membrane, okay? And this movement of sodium ions in, uh, this is a current because a current just means the movement of charged particles. You've got a movement of charged particles into the cell. This is called the IF. So I is the symbol for current and the F is for funny. So this is called the funny current basically. Okay, so when people first saw this, they thought it was really odd, so they called it the funny current. Okay, so uh, now we know it's through these HCN channels. So on our graph, what you will see is basically a depolarization uh, of, uh, well, gradual depolarization of the electrical potential difference across the membrane. Now, when this rises to the threshold potential for the activation of uh, voltage gated ion channels, which is at around negative 40 millivolts, those voltage-gated ion channels will open and they are going to then cause the action potential. Now, the action potential you actually get in the sinoatrial node is a little bit more uh, odd than the action potential that you get elsewhere. So instead of voltage-gated sodium channels being responsible for the upstroke of the action potential, it is instead T-type voltage-gated calcium channels, which we have already seen. Those, remember, are voltage-gated calcium channels. If I can just find paper. Those are voltage-gated calcium channels where the alpha-1 subunit is um, I, within that CAV3 family. Okay, I don't know if I am going to be able to find the piece of paper. Never mind. Okay, so T-type voltage-gated calcium channels are when where the alpha-1 subunit is within the CAV3 family, basically. It's either CAV3.1, CAV3.2, or CAV3.3. Now, if we go back to our picture, we'll draw one of these in up here, okay? So it starts off with the HCN channel here, which causes the funny current of sodium into the cell. Okay, so this is the funny current. Then we'll draw our T-type voltage-gated calcium channel here with all of its different subunits. So here's the alpha-1 subunit here. This is supposed to represent the gamma subunit here. You've got the beta subunit at the bottom, and then you've got the alpha-2 delta subunit over here. Okay, and this is a T-type voltage-gated calcium channel. So as I've just said, the alpha-1 subunit needs to be within that CAV3 family. Now, when it opens, we know what happens. Uh, calcium concentration in our extracellularly is around 1.5 millimolar. Intracellularly, it's around 100 millimolar. Sorry, 100 nanomolar, that should be. 100 nanomolar. Uh, that means there's a 15,000-fold gradient favoring the movement of calcium into the cell, so you get calcium movement in. Okay, and this is going to bring more positively charged particles into the cytoplasm of the cell, and therefore you're going to further depolarize uh, the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane. 
So what happens is you get the upstroke of the action potential. Now, T-type voltage-gated calcium channels are called T-type for a good reason. The T stands for transient, okay? And transient means short-lived. So the time for which these T-type voltage-gated calcium channels are actually open is extremely short, basically. So they close very, very quickly. So these T-type voltage-gated calcium channels will close. That will stop the further depolarization of the electrical potential difference across the sinoatrial node cell uh, membrane. And you just get to a level just above zero millivolts, basically. So it just gets to the point where the electrical potential difference across the membrane is positive, i.e. Uh, the electrical potential intracellularly is greater than the electrical potential extracellularly. Okay, and then what will happen is the voltage-gated potassium channels will finally get around to actually opening. So it's the same problem as before. The voltage-gated potassium channels are extremely slow to open, basically. They were activated down here at threshold potential. Uh, at the same time as the T-type voltage-gated calcium channels, but they were just so slow about opening. So they just about get to, to the point where they're ready to open by the time the T-type voltage-gated calcium channels have, o have closed, rather, and they will allow potassium to move out of the cell and when you move positive charge out of the cell, that will then repolarize the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane because we are taking positive charge out of the intracellular compartment and therefore reducing the electrical potential intracellularly. And we are putting positive charge into the extracellular compartment and therefore increasing the electrical potential extracellularly. Therefore, when we ask, what is this number relative to this number? Well, if this one's going up and this one's going down, then when you move from here to here, the number is going to get more negative, basically. So you're going to repolarize the electrical potential difference. Okay, like so. And then, of course, what will happen is uh, the voltage-gated potassium channels will then inactivate and uh, you will then go back to the resting membrane potential. Okay, and then it will all occur over again, basically, because the HCN channels will become activated again, and you'll get the thing occurring all over again. Okay, so that's how these sinoatrial node cells are spontaneously generating these action potentials. These action potentials will propagate along their membranes, and they then have electrical windows to neighboring cells, which may well be normal cardiomyocytes, normal contractile cardiomyocytes, and they'll induce action potentials in these normal cardiomyocytes, and then the whole thing will propagate along. So that's how the sinoatrial node is setting off these action potentials spontaneously. Now, we want to discuss how the beta-1 adrenoreceptor is going to uh, activate the uh, quickening of the generation of action potentials. Now, basically, it's because the beta-1 adrenoreceptor leads to the production of cyclic AMP, so it's not protein kinase A this time. We looked at going all the way through to protein kinase A because we'll need protein kinase A later. But actually, you don't need protein kinase A to activate the HCN channel. What you need is the cyclic AMP. So when you activate the beta-1 adrenoreceptor, we've discussed that what will happen is you'll activate the GS heterotrimeric G protein. And that will activate adenylyl cyclases, which will produce cyclic AMP. Okay? The eight subunits of the HCN channel have a special domain uh, in their C-terminal tail here that I've just highlighted in purple. Okay, and this special domain is called the nucleotide binding domain. Okay, so this is the nucleotide binding domain here. Okay, uh, specifically, some people will put a C there for cyclic nucleotide binding domain. Okay, so this is the cyclic nucleotide binding domain. Okay, and this is capable of binding to cyclic AMP. So 
In the total HCN channel, we have four HCN subunits. Each of them will have a cyclic nucleotide binding domain on their C-terminal tail. So four cyclic AMP molecules in total combined to a hyperpolarization activated cyclic nucleotide gated uh, cation channel. Okay, and what's the effect of cyclic AMP binding to this channel? Well, basically, it increases the conductance of this channel. So it increases the number of sodium ions that will be moving through this channel when it's open in a certain amount of time. Okay, so basically if you were to sit and watch this channel for a second or a millisecond maybe is a more physiologically relevant time scale and count the number of ions that go through, you'd find a certain number. When you bind four cyclic AMP molecules, basically what you can imagine is the channel widens a little bit, and now the number of ions that are actually moving through there in a second will be greater. Okay, so that means that the rapidity with which the HCN channels will depolarize the cell membrane is going to be greater. So what will actually happen is this initial phase of the um, sinoatrial node action potential will become steeper and you'll get something that looks like this now okay and then they'll happen again and again and again so let me get another piece of paper and draw this out again okay right so let's draw the normal sinoatrial node action potential and then contrast it to what it will look like once we have um, bound cyclic AMP to our HCN channel so here is the normal sinoatrial node action potential. This is negative 80 millivolts, so the HCN channels become active. They'll depolarize the membrane to around negative 40 millivolts threshold potential for the activation of the T-type voltage-gated calcium channels. The T-type voltage-gated calcium channels will open and allow calcium into the cell, depolarizing the cell very rapidly. Then the voltage-gated potassium channels will finally open, uh, finally getting around to that uh, when they were activated all the way back here. And at that same time, the T-type voltage-gated calcium channels will close. The voltage-gated potassium channels will repolarize the cell membrane. Okay, then they too will close. And then, of course, the HCN channels will open again. And you'll go around the entire cycle again, like so. Okay, now, each time the uh, sinoatrial node fires an action potential, this is a heartbeat, basically. So each one of these represents a heartbeat. Now, basically, if we increase um, the conductance through the HCN channels by uh, binding cyclic AMP to the cyclic nucleotide binding domain of each of the subunits of the HCN channel, then the steepness of this first phase will go up hugely. And then, basically, everything after that will just be exactly the same. Okay, and then we'll have a really steep HCN phase again, then the T-type calcium channels, then the voltage-gated potassium channels, and then the really steep HCN phase again. Okay, and I hope the message is clear. In this one, once we've um, bound cyclic AMP to our HCN channels, which I'm now going to highlight in red to distinguish it from the other one. Okay, you have got three of these sinoatrial node action potentials into the same time interval as we had um, two sinoatrial node action potentials in the previous one. Okay, so basically each one of these represents a heartbeat, so your heartbeat, heart rate rather, is going to go up. Okay, so basically, the reason that beta 1 adrenergic receptors, when stimulated on the sinoatrial node, increase the heart rate is that they increase the rate at which the sinoatrial node will generate action potentials. Okay, so they increase the number of action potentials that the sinoatrial node spontaneously generates within a minute, and each of those spontaneous action potentials causes the heart to beat, and therefore um, you increase the heart rate by increasing the number of uh, spontaneous action potentials that the sinoatrial node uh, produces in a minute. Okay, so that's how beta-1 adrenoreceptors increase uh, the rate at which the heart beats. In the next video, what we'll do is turn our attention to how the beta-1 adrenoreceptors uh, increase the force with which the heart contracts.